Our second lesson this morning comes from the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16, verses 24 through 34. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At that same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before him. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> For the last 10 years, I have spent a few days after Easter with three colleagues and friends who are also Presbyterian pastors. During our time together, we talk about the work we're doing. We offer each other feedback and encouragement. We share good food and enjoy the beautiful scenery of Montreat, North Carolina. Each year, we also meet with another pastor, usually someone further along in their career than we are, and ask for their advice on any number of topics. Last year, we met with a former pastor named Faye Avis, who talked to us about Soul Shop, an organization he founded to equip faith leaders and congregations to minister to those in their midst suffering from a sense of despair, especially when their desperation is so profound that it leads them to contemplate suicide. We met with Faye in a bookstore in Asheville, North Carolina. We got some coffee and found a quiet corner of the shop. I was expecting that we would sit there and ask Faye some questions about his work and his ministry, which is how these conversations usually go. But Faye had something else in mind. He had come prepared with questions to ask us. And the first one he asked was this, can you think of a time in your life when you felt a sense of despair to the point where you considered ending your life? One by one, we took turns answering that question. And in our group of four 40-something pastors, three of the four of us could name such a time. The wider research confirms that our small group is consistent with society at large. The research shows that 80% of adults will seriously consider suicide at some point in their lives. The research also shows that identifying with a particular religion has no protective effect. There's no difference in rates across denominational lines. What does have a slightly protective effect is not identifying with a religion per se, but being an active participant in a faith community. Faye Avis has dedicated the latter part of his ministry to helping faith communities recognize and support those in their midst suffering from despair. When Paul and Silas end up unjustly imprisoned in Philippi, secured in the innermost cell, their feet in stocks, you might think they would succumb to despair but they do not. Together, they sing hymns and say prayers, and when an earthquake shakes the prison so violently that all the prisoners are freed from their chains and the doors to the prison come open, Paul and Silas do not immediately escape. 
The person in this story who despairs is the jailer. After the earthquake, he wakes up to find the jail no longer intact. The doors are open, the chains of the prisoners are broken, and he is horrified. Even if there was this natural disaster of an earthquake, he is the one who will lose his job, and worse, his honor, if the prisoners escape on his watch. He's the jailer on duty. There's no one who can attest that it was actually the earthquake that set the prisoners free. And with no one to corroborate his story, he concludes that the only option is to end his life. And so he pulls out his sword. But he is not as alone as he fears. Before he can make another move, Paul shouts out, do not harm yourself. We are all here. We are all here. That's what Paul says to the jailer to stop him from harming himself. We are all here. Dan Savage is a well-known columnist and journalist. Back in 2010, in response to a rash of teen suicides traced to bullying of youth who were gay or perceived to be gay, Dan and his husband Terry sat down and they recorded a video which they posted online. In this video, they shared their experiences with bullying during their own adolescence, and they talked about how things changed as they got older, and especially after they met each other. At this point, they'd been married for five years, and they were raising a son together. The point they wanted to get across to these teenagers is that life gets better and they should stick around to see that happen. When Dan and Terry posted this video online, it went viral, and within just a few weeks, thousands of other people had posted videos as well, all with the same message of hope. It gets better. What was so powerful about this project wasn't just the message. It was the sheer number of people who were willing to speak out publicly And this in itself sent the message to thousands of people who were struggling with isolation and despair that they were not alone. Do not despair. We are all here. Just last week, a similar kind of campaign exploded through social media when the actress Alyssa Milano used her Twitter account to encourage women who'd been sexually harassed or assaulted to reply with the words, Me Too. Within the first 24 hours after she posted that message, the hashtag Me Too had been tweeted nearly half a million times, and that was just on Twitter. On other social media platforms, feeds filled up with women and men posting about their experiences, or just writing those two simple words, me too. By the end of the week, there were more than 12 million posts with this hashtag. To see the sheer volume of women and men in our society who've had these experiences, and to discover that they include our friends and our family members, and our classmates, and our fellow church members, gives all of us a deeper understanding of the prevalence of sexual harassment and assault in our society. But just to write these words is a way to communicate to someone feeling a sense of isolation and despair because of what they have suffered. Do not despair. We are all here. Earlier, Gillian read to us from Genesis chapter 2, the second of two creation accounts in the Bible. In my experience, this is not the creation story we tend to focus on, perhaps because it can be difficult for us at a time of heightened awareness of the destructiveness of gender stereotypes to imagine God creating woman simply as a companion for man. But if we can let go of such a literal reading of the story, It has a much deeper and a profoundly important message. It imagines how things might have gone had God just created one human being. After creating this one human being, God observes this marvel, and then 
For the first and only time in all the accounts of creation, God declares that God has done something not good. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So God brings creature after extraordinary creature before this human being to keep him company. But in spite of all these attempts, that one human being remains miserably, desperately lonely. Finally, God makes a second human being out of the same stuff as the first. And that turns out to be just what is needed. This is not a story about gender, and it is certainly not a story about the superiority of one gender over another. It is also not a story about why we should limit marriage to a man and a woman. This is a story about the degree to which we human beings, beloved children of God, made in God's own image, need one another. It is a story about why it can be life-threatening to feel isolated and alone. You may have read this week that the Me Too movement is not a new one. The first person to use these words to start a social movement to normalize and publicize the problem of sexual violence was a woman named Tarana Burke. Burke founded this movement in 2006. She was working with an organization in Alabama that ran a camp for young people, and there was a 13-year-old girl who was a part of this camp. Burke calls her Heaven, and she was clearly troubled. One day, Heaven came to Burke and began to tell her about the sexual violence she had suffered. But Burke, at the time, she didn't know how to respond. So she sent Heaven away to talk to someone else. Instead, Heaven left the camp and never came back. In her guilt, Burke kept imagining how she could have handled that conversation differently. And one question kept coming to her. Why didn't I just say to her, me too? There are few things in life that cause us a greater sense of despair than the feeling that we are alone, that our experience is unique, that no one else could possibly understand the depth of our pain and sorrow. And there are few things more powerful than for us to recognize when someone is suffering, to draw alongside them and remind them that they are not alone. Do not despair. We are all here. The second creation account in Genesis reminds us that being made in God's image means that God created us not to live in isolation, but in community, God calls us into communities so that we might learn to recognize the image of God in ourselves, but also in the many and diverse people we encounter, in our families, in our schools, our neighborhoods, our workplaces, and right here in church. We might think or wish that church could be a place we'd gather with like-minded people bound together by shared religious beliefs, and of course, it is that to some degree, but when we read the book of Acts, we are constantly reminded that from the beginning, the church has existed to bring together people of all different kinds, different ethnicities and cultures and education and social status and politics. What brings us together and what binds us together is the most fundamental and important thing about each one of us. We are made in the image of God and we are transformed by God's love revealed to us in Jesus Christ. Last August, here in this sanctuary, we hosted a lecture by the Christian physician, Dr. Willie Parker, who currently works as an abortion provider in the Deep South. If you weren't here, I recommend that you go to our website or our podcast and listen to what he had to say. You may not agree with it, but his voice and perspective is a profound addition to this conversation. 
During his talk, Dr. Parker shared that the work he does does not require him to set aside his deeply held religious convictions. Instead, his work requires him to mine those convictions to better understand the concept of shared humanity. He identified four primary identities that define him. He is heterosexual, black, male, and Christian. But, he said, I'm never going to be more heterosexual, black, male, and Christian than I am human. His work has taught him that what defines us all is our humanity. And it is this same humanity that connects us and enables us to say to any one of our fellow human beings who is suffering, do not despair. We are all here. The Apostle Paul could say this even to his jailer, because Paul had learned that God cares more about our shared humanity than about any other traits that distinguish us from one another. For that jailer, Paul's words saved his life. And then they changed his life. They revealed to him something so profound that he and his family are baptized, claiming their place in this new family of God. Both the Bible and our own experiences teach us that every single one of us will know despair. For some, it will be a passing and circumstantial emotion. For others, it will be an inexplicable, lifelong affliction. Fortunately, we live in a time where greater awareness of mental health means that treatments are available that can save lives. But as a community of believers, as those bound together by our shared humanity and our conviction that God's love is for every one of us, we are also called to have eyes to see when one among us is suffering and to reveal God's love by offering potentially life-saving, profound comfort with these simple words. God is here. We are here. You are not alone. Amen.